I was asked to talk something about open banking and has something happened yet in, in open banking and with the introduction of PSD2. And then we came up with the, with the slogan, is it just smoke and mirrors? Well, hopefully you'll find out soon. Um, so yeah, my name is Janne. Uh, I've been working with open banking now a bit under two, two years now. Uh, my background is in, uh, in Nokia, Microsoft, and then, uh, then I did a bit of consulting, and, uh, and now I'm in, in Nordea. I'm kind of a hybrid business uh, uh, developer type of, type of guy, so, so, or you could say generalist, so not, not an expert in, in anything, but I can talk with developers and, and business guys. All right. So if you... This is the short recap of, of what PSD2 is. I'm not going to go into regulation or anything, but this is, this is what sparked PSD2. So, uh, FinTechs asked that how, can we, can, how could we build on, on top of bank APIs? Where, where are your APIs? Okay, oh, and of course banks didn't want to, to open APIs if we didn't have to, or if, if, it, it, if it wasn't... Uh, uh, beneficial for us, so then EU decided that, yep, you're going to open up the APIs. So now we are doing, all banks are doing platform economy now, so we're in a lucky, lucky position. Uh, yeah, um, a bit about, I um, was thinking of talking about a few myths first. So um, is, is open banking only about smoke and mirrors? Well, myth number one. PSD2 is here, but nothing has actually changed. No one sees any difference. Well, my thesis is that it's a bit too early to judge. Because you always have to start, by the way, with, this, with these graphs, because it gives you credibility. And this is a Gartner uh, uh, hype curve type of graph. You might have seen it in, in, in other, other uh, uh, businesses as well. So as you see, open banking is now, or we, we consider open banking now being somewhere here in the, in the middle. And uh, you can see a, a lot of uh, familiar names, internal APIs, private APIs, hackathons, for example. You can see hackathons all over now in the, in the market. Everyone's doing ha hackathons. So we agree that it's somewhere, somewhere around here. But then... If you know about PSD2, it's being enforced only in September here in Finland. So kind of judging the PSD2 as an initiative before September is a bit unfair, perhaps. So the, the actual applications, they are coming around here, let's say, in one year or so. Uh, then, of course, I want to talk something about here, what's coming up, because uh, we're starting to talk about API marketplaces, uh, open banking strategy, digital marketplaces, and sort of... The, the, if you listen to major banks in the Europe, that's what they, they want to talk about. I bet uh, none of us are yet there, but in, in a couple of years, maybe five years, I'm sure uh, we, will be, we will be there. Or well, that's the ambition, at least. And talking about that... Um, I think it's fair to say that the competitive landscape of, of banking and banks has changed quite a lot. So we are here on the, on the bottom right, and now entering our market is not only Nordic banks, but global banks who are, everyone is building a platform nowadays, so this is BBVA's vision of a, of a banking platform. But then we have all the, all the fintechs, such as Revolut and those, which we really pay close attention to. And then, of course, you can't forget the big techs, which, which is easily, easily forgotten. I mean, uh, in the previous keynotes, we, we heard uh, these GAFA terms and these, but I wanted to just talk a bit about, about this. So banking is a service which people need, and I think was it our uh, CEO, Casper, who said that people will need banking, but not banks in the future. So this could be a, a thing you, you use in a couple of years. And that's kind of our challenge as a, as a bank, how to stay relevant in the future. And I guess one of our, our bets in 
staying relevant in the future is partnering up with the best. Because Nordea used to create applications themselves inside in-house, but now we, we present our customers uh, Apple Pay, Google Pay, Samsung Pay, and I think Garmin, Garmin Pay and Fitbit Pay are the only ones we, we offer uh, exclusively in Finland. So you could say that we, we try to give a wide variety of, uh, of services to our customers, not necessarily developed by us, but we still want to want to present the services which are best in the market and be the preferred partner in, in, in providing those services. So that could be one of those uh, roads to staying rele relevant. And as, uh, as Casper, our CEO, says, how banking will look like in the future, we don't know. But we, we, we want to make bets. We want to make bets on how banking will look like, and one of our bets is this, uh, this open banking and platform economy. We don't actually know how it will shape up, but this is something, the, the capabilities are here which we, which we believe in that are relevant in the future. Okay, myth number two. Open banking is only about compliance. It's only a compliance exercise for banks. This is I've been hearing a lot. Well, it's true. Before going, going forward, it's true. It started from compliance, but then it relates to all this, leads into these in, in, interesting discussions. That okay, uh, for example, life and pension guys inside the bank, they come to us and say, that, okay, we heard these APIs are pretty cool. Build us an API. Yay. <laughs> and then, then it leads to these discussions. Okay, what do you want your API to do? And I think Mario has done an excellent job on, 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 on the AP of cycles to actually fill out business canvases on how to, or business model canvases on what, uh, what uh, problems your API will solve and how you, you could treat your API as a product. And actually that's something which is pretty interesting. It's lead, lead inside the bank, the, the open banking has, or the compliance APIs had lead to this. And this is our commercial API scope, which we just released. So there are a lot of uh, API products which we are releasing now this year and next year, because we see that these, providing these products will lead to uh, uh, penetration in different markets and whole, whole uh, new channels. A few of those are here instant reporting, corporate payout. They're more likely to you know, replace these file-based services from, from the SAP world. But then again, we just uh, launched FX listed rates and market orders. So you could say that they're truly the building blocks of, of platform economy. If, say, you're an e-commerce store and your uh, customers want to buy in a, in a different uh, currency than your currency. So then you need a, a tool in between to do these uh, FX orders. So, and we're just about to see an, on, on which kind of end services could be made possible using these, these building blocks. Again, we don't know, but we see that uh, these as these capabilities we want to provide to our customers going forward. And this is uh, another way of saying that we, like I said, with the Apple Pay and, and, and Google Pay things, that we want to be the preferred partner in the Nordics providing these uh, API marketplaces or, or services. We, we don't necessarily uh, want to do them ourselves, but we want to be the go-to bank who, who cool services come to or good fintechs, fintechs come to and want to partner up with. Uh, this is, by the way, an uh, uh, old number. I just heard that it's over 4,000 now, which we have, have in, in the, in the uh, developer portal. We got applause. It, it wasn't me, but it was someone else. <laughs> All right. And this is kind of continuing on the story as well I, I showed before, that uh, we're now doing hands deep doing PSD to compliance, but we've seen the first commercial APIs from emerging from open banking. So you could say we're somewhere around, uh, around uh, 
around here in the in the middle but going up the up the curve then is uh, is, is this uh, premium api marketplace concept and and that and i i'd say we're we're not quite there yet but that's the that's the ambition at least all right uh, Myth number three, open banking is ignoring corporates. So it's only, I've been getting this uh, statement a lot as well. It's only about uh, fintechs and TPPs and nothing for, for big corporates. Well, I just wanted to show an uh, uh, excellent co-creation example by open banking and Finnair that we had a concrete uh, use case to present how open banking could serve our, our, our corporate customers as well. Uh, this is just as a background. This is how Finnair sees their uh, uh, platform. So, so kind of uh, uh, their journey of the, you can see in the, in the top from booking to destination post trip. That's how they see the customer journey and how their platform is, is formed around, around the, the journey of the customer. So as a concrete example, we have currently we have this uh, agreement with Finnair that we, if you want to apply for a credit card on Finnair's uh, pages, uh, you need to do one, two, three, four, five clicks, and then you get this really, really nice and agile-looking web page here on the right. And Finnair was was deciding that okay, this is probably not good enough, so so people will drop out when they see this kind of hideous page there. Oh, I don't know if. If you're an engineer, you might have liked that, but, but for some, at least, it's hideous and, and, and painful. All right. Uh, yeah, so that's, the, that's uh, the summary. Eight steps with three redirects between pages. That's the current, current flow if you want to apply for the Finnair MasterCard. What we did with open banking, it looks like, like this. Five steps. Pretty simple, light-looking forms, no redirects, and then you can submit the, the, the MasterCard application straight on Finner's web pages. And even though if you're not a UX designer, you can probably think that, okay, what about the conversion rate? It has to go up like 10 or 20 or 30 percent. All right. So benefits of open banking for corporates, and this is Finner's words, not ours, is uh, opportunities can be made in financial services, creating a lot of customer value, providing data from throughout the process, and then land of opportunity because combining APIs can lead to services which are more than the actual. So the sum is more than the actual actual parts in the in the in the offering. Myth number four. Oh, but you forgot the, about the developers. Well, no, we didn't, because our, our portal has been awarded uh, the best developer experience in the, in the market by InnoPay. This was updated in 2018, so let's see what, what's happening this year. My um, uh, guess is that because playing catch-up is a bit easier than being the market leader in developer experience, so we will perhaps see more uh, of a flat uh, curve here, or we will move a bit left, but hopefully also a bit upwards as well, because we launched new, new APIs. So here on the, on the uh, y-axis is the number of APIs and the kind of wide variety of the, of the API buffet, in a, in a way. Um, yeah, because banks aren't aren't that much into or awarded for innovation. I'm happy to see that, uh, that the uh, crowd has accepted open banking well. So we got, uh, this says three awards, but I think we, we received one award since I made this slide about instant reporting. So for the, bringing up the first premium API product into the market. Um, yeah, that's by the way, old as well, so about a, a bit above 4,000 developers. And of course, 
measuring developer experience is a bit hard. There, there can be tons of, of, of uh, scales how to measure developer experience. And I'm th thinking that Jarkko Moilonen and Marjukka perhaps know, know a bit more about, about the terms. But uh, however you, you measure it, I think we're still quite high in the, in the market there. Yeah, and that's with the instant reporting API in the bottom right. Uh, that's where we where we won the first or the fourth um, um, prize. And I wanted to show this slide because uh, we actually advertise in the bank that when we have this developer community, we can actually validate quickly in the market by providing uh, a teaser in, in the newsletters or, or, uh, or on Twitter and then posting something on the sandbox. So we're pretty open about it that we gather market feedback by providing uh, APIs first in the sandbox and gathering feedback before investing heavily and bringing the APIs into, into production. So, and I think this is the uh, idea of PSD2 sandboxes as well, but you could bring it further and, and think about all, uh, all API products as well in the same, same manner. And then when you have validated it in the market, you, know you can make adjustments, release it into production, and then maybe half a year later or so, you can get uh, customers to real production data. Myth number five. Ah, but the PSD2 license is too hard to get if you're a fintech. Too painful, too hard to get. So open banking isn't, isn't any good at this. Yeah. So this is an, actually an interesting uh, term because I could or we could blame, uh, you know, the FSA and the, the uh, uh, authorities saying that, okay, we have nothing to do with the licenses, so don't blame us. But I wanted to do a bit of uh, uh, another angle on another approach on this. I say true, but it gets even harder after that when you got the license. Because then you have to think about consent, authorization, manage the uh, uh, transferred payment and personal data in a secure way, GDPR, define accountability, because PSD2 doesn't require contractual re relationship between banks and TPPs. Then you have to think about AML processes, if you read about what happened with Revolut this, this spring, they had their um, AML uh, um, uh, tools offline, I believe, for a couple of weeks, and there was a huge storm about that, that how can you, how can you do these types of payments without any AML uh, screening? Well, I think the discussion still continues on, on who is funding Revolut and what are their you know, end goals and that. But you have to do AML if you, if you need to, or if you want to be a fintech and you want to operate with open APIs, you need to figure out how to do AML properly. And of course, compliance. How do you, how do you then, uh, if regulators audit you, if you get this PSD2 license, you have to actually be ready to, to face these audits. So. If you look at this, uh, or yeah, there, there it was. So if you look at this uh, um, playing field here, I would argue that getting the PSD2 license is just the start of, of your journey as a fintech. You need to figure out all these other things if you want to be a, a successful fintech business. All right. So as a summary, Number one, PSD2 is here, nothing changed, not true. Open banking is only about compliance, not true. Not true about ignoring corporates. And I argue that we didn't forget the developers. But then the last one, I, I struggle, to, what, what do we... It's, it's not fair to say it's busted, but at least uh, it's so and so, I would say it's true, but it gets even harder, like I said. So, depending on who you are, if you're the authorities, then I think it's uh, fair to say it's, it's not painful, but if you're a f small fintech just trying to figure, figure things out, then yeah, it's painful. All right. I guess that was, that was all.